How many families have you shattered with that nine millimeter of yours? You don't even know the meaning of loss. Not yet, you fucking hypocrite. You want to know the real difference between us, Alex? I already know the difference. I'm still sane, and you're not. The difference is, I'm alive because none of you people have been able to bring me down. And you're alive because I haven't decided to kill you yet. I'm not going to kill you, Kyle. The words were just spilling out of me now. I'm going to make sure you rot to death slowly back in that cell in Colorado where you came from. You're going back. Oh, that reminds me, he said, and then abruptly hung up. Suddenly, Bree was right there with her arms around me. I spoke to Nana, she said. Everything's fine, but she knows we're coming home, and I've got a squad car headed over there right now. I got up and started dressing as fast as I could. My body was shaking with anger, and not just at Kyle. I messed up, Bree, I said. Bad. I can't let him get to me like that. I can't. It's only going to make things worse. Kyle had just accomplished exactly what he wanted, which was to inject himself into my life. He had my number in more ways than one. Now I had no choice but to respond. An MPD cruiser was in front of the house when we got there, with another uniformed officer in the back by the garage. Samson was there, too. I'm not even sure who called him, but I was glad he came. All cool, sugar. We're good here, he said as we came in. He and Nana were hanging out in the kitchen. This isn't over, I said. It was a struggle to keep my voice down while the kids slept upstairs. We have to talk about moving the family. Oh, is that so? Nana said, and the temperature in the room dropped about twenty degrees. Nana? Alex, no, not again. You do what you need to with the children. I, for one, meant it the last time when I said it would be the last time. I'm not moving out of this house, and that's my final word on the subject. Before I could even respond, she decided she wasn't done after all. And another thing. If this Kyle Craig is as good as you say he is, then it doesn't matter where you put the children. What matters... Detective Cross is that you protect them where they are. Her voice was shaking, but her finger was steady as she pointed it right at my face. Defend your home, Alex. Make it happen. You're supposed to be good at your job. She smacked the table twice with the flat of her hand and leaned back again. My move. First, I took a breath and counted to ten. Then I asked Bree to start the APB process right away. Get it out on Wales, all jurisdictions, then NCIC at the Bureau as soon as we can. For that, we did a warrant number, and Samson got on the stick to track it down. Meanwhile, I made another call and woke up my good buddy and sometimes sparring mate, Rakim Powell. Rakim had been with the force for 15 years, and a detective with the 103rd for eight. Now he had his own close security firm in Silver Spring, and I was about to become a client. By seven that morning, we had a whole system in place. The kids were covered to and from school by me and Bree, with Samson as backup. Rakim's firm would provide overnight security, front and back, with daytime coverage as needed. Life under siege. Kyle Craig was back in our lives. I was at home when I got the call about the latest sniper murder near Woodley Park. Detective Cross, it's Sergeant Ed Fleischman from 2D. We've got a nasty homicide up here, very possible sniper fire. Who's the deceased, I asked. Mel DeLuey, sir. That's why I called you. He fits right into the mold on your case. DeLuey was currently out on bail, but still at the center of what looked to be one of the biggest insider tax scandals in U.S. history. The allegations were that he'd used his position in the district's IRS office to funnel tens of millions in taxpayer dollars to himself, his family, and his friends, usually through non-profit children's charities that didn't actually exist. Another sniper incident, and another bad guy right out of the headlines. We had a pattern. The case had just jumped to a new level, too. I was determined we'd get this right from the very start. If it had to be a circus, I could at least try to make sure it was my circus. Where are you? I asked the sergeant. 32nd, just off Cleveland Avenue, sir. Uh, you know the area? I do. Second District was the only one in the city with zero homicides in the last calendar year. So much for that statistic. I could already feel the neighborhood panic going up. Did the fire board get there? Yes, sir. The victims confirmed dead. And the house is clear? I asked. We ran a protective sweep, and Mrs. DeLuis with us now. I can ask for consent to search if you want. No, if anyone's inside, I want them out, 
Call DC Mobile Crime. They can start photographing, but nobody touches anything until I get there. I told Sergeant Fleischman. Do you have any idea where the shots came from yet? Either the backyard or the neighbor's place behind that. Nobody's home over there, Fleischman told me. Okay, set up a command post on the street, not in the yard, Sergeant. I want officers at the front and back doors and another at the neighbor's house. Anyone wants to get into either place, they go through you first. And then the answer is no. Not until I'm on site. This is an MPD crime scene and I'm ranking homicide. You're going to see FBI, ATF, maybe the chief too. He lives a lot closer than I do. Tell him to call me in the car if he wants. Anything else, Detective? Fleischman sounded just a little overwhelmed. Not that I blamed him. Most 2D officers aren't used to this kind of thing. Yeah, talk to your first responders. I don't want any jaw-jacking with the press or the neighbors. No one. As far as you guys are concerned, they haven't seen a thing. They don't know a thing. Just keep the whole place locked down tight until I'm there. I'll try, he said. No, Sergeant, you'll just do it. Trust me, we have to keep this thing locked down tight. Unfortunately, the press was going berserk when I got there. Dozens of cameras were jockeying for an angle on Mel and Nina DeLuis Whitestone House, either out front at the barriers that Sergeant Ed Fleischman had established, or over on 31st, where a separate detail had been dispatched just to keep people from coming in through the back, which they certainly would do. Samson met me at the scene, straight from a faculty thing at Georgetown where his wife, Billy, taught nursing. Can't say I'm glad this happened, he told me. But shit. How much wine and cheese can a man eat in one lifetime? We started in the living room where the DeLuis had reportedly been watching an episode of The Closer. The TV was still on, ironically with a live news shot of the house now. That's creepy, said Samson. The press like to talk about invasion of privacy except when they're doing the invading. Mrs. DeLuis's initial statement was that she'd heard a tinkle of glass, looked over at the broken window, and only then noticed her husband's head slumped over with his eyes wide open in the recliner next to hers. I could still hear her crying in the kitchen with one of our counselors, and my heart went out to her some. What a nightmare. Mel DeLuis was still sitting in his chair. The single bullet wound in his temple looked relatively clean, with a small blue-black halo around the entry. Samson pointed to it with the tip of a pen. Let's say he gets shot here, he said, and raised the pen about six inches to where DeLuis' head would have been positioned. And it comes in, he drew the pen in an arc until it was pointing at the broken glass, over there. That's a downward angle, I said. The bullet had pierced one of the top panes in a six-over-one window that looked out to the backyard. Without any discussion, we both walked around to the dining room and outside through a pair of French doors. A brick patio in the back gave way to a long, narrow yard. Two floodlights on the side of the house lit about half of the space, but it didn't look like there were any outbuildings or trees big enough to support someone's weight. Beyond that, the rear neighbor's three-story Tudor was backlit by the street lamp on 31st. Two huge oaks dominated that yard, mostly obscured in the shadow of the house. You said nobody was home over there? Samson asked. That right? Out of town, in fact, I said. Someone knew exactly what he was doing. Maybe he's showing off. Shooter's got a reputation to live up to after that first hit. Assuming this is he. It's he, I said. Excuse me, detective? Sergeant Ed Fleischman was suddenly standing there. I looked down at his hands to make sure he was gloved. What are you doing back here, Sergeant? There's plenty for you to do out front. Two things, sir. We've had a couple of neighbors reporting strange vehicles. Vehicles, plural? Fleischman nodded. For whatever it's worth, one old Buick with New York plates parked up the street off and on for several days. He checked the pad in his hand. And a large, dark-colored SUV, maybe a Suburban, definitely beat up. It was out on the street for a few hours late last night. This wasn't the kind of neighborhood where old cars looked at home. At least not outside of service hours. We'd have to follow up on both vehicles right away. What was the other thing, I asked. FBI's here. Tell them to send ERT around to the neighbor's yard, I told the sergeant. Not them, sir. It's an agent. He asked for you specifically. Peering back inside, I could see a tall white guy in a generic bureau suit. He was leaning over, with his blue-gloved hands on his knees, staring at the hole in Mel DeLuis' head. Hey! I called through the broken window. 
Why do you need to be in there? He either didn't hear me or didn't want to. What's his name? I asked Fleischman. Siegel, sir. Hey, Siegel! I shouted this time, and then I started inside. Don't touch anything in there! When Alex came into the room, Kyle stood up and looked right into his eyes. Dead man walking, Kyle thought, and smiled as he extended a hand. Max Siegel, Washington Field Office. How you doing? Not so good, I imagine. What are you doing in here? I'm just hitting the ground on this one, Kyle told him. No shit. I mean, what specifically do you need on this body? It was magnificent. Cross had no idea who he was looking at. The face was flawless, of course. If there was any danger here, it was with Alex's ears, not his eyes. This was where the weeks of audio surveillance on Max Siegel in Miami would really start to pay off. But first he did exactly what Cross wouldn't expect. He turned his back on him and knelt down to look at the entry wound again. Ballistics, he said finally and stood up again. My money's on 7.62 by 51 NATO match gray, but not jacketed. And some kind of military training on the shooter. You've read the file, Alex said, not offering any compliment, just noticing. Yeah, we could definitely use some ballistic support from the Bureau to confirm, but let's get the ME in here before anything else. In the meantime, I need you to step out. Listen, Kyle said. I'm not going to stress about who gets credit for what on this one. I mean, the U.S. attorney is going to step in and get all front and center no matter who brings it home. Am I right? Siegel, I don't have time for this right now. I. But make no mistake. Kyle let the last of Siegel's buddy-buddy smile fade away. We got two incidents and three homicides all inside the district. That's a federal crime. So you can work with us if you like. Well, you can get the fuck out of the way. He showed Cross his sweet little encrypted sigaloo fresh off the line. One call and I can make this whole crime scene my own private country club. It's up to you, detective. What do you want to do? It took about ten seconds for me to figure out what Max Siegel was all about, and I wasn't going to have any of it. Listen, Siegel, I'm not going to pretend I can keep you off this case any more than you could do the same to me. But let me make one thing very clear here. This is an MPD crime scene. I'm ranking homicide. And if you want to take that up with the chief, he's right outside. Meanwhile, if I have to tell you how quickly a room like this can cool, then you shouldn't be here to begin with. No doubt there would be a full task force after tonight, and I'd probably find myself working with this bureau jerk-off as we moved forward. But right now was not the best time for pissing contests, by him or by me. Right away, Siegel started talking again. Holding forth was more like it. Military snipers go after high-value targets. Officers, not enlisted men. The way I see it, that's what these victims are. Not the bank president, but the congressman and the lobbyist who keep him juiced. And not the taxpayer who's been ripping off Uncle Sam, but the other way around. I listened without saying too much. This guy wanted to lecture, not collaborate. But he was also pretty good at what he did. If there were things he could see here that I couldn't, then I needed to bite my tongue long enough to find out what they were. The street outside the DeLuey house was filling up slowly and steadily. A thing of beauty. Denny and Mitch hung around the edge of the crowd, not coming too close, but close enough to take it in. Given the shitty night they'd had at the shelter after the first hit, Denny figured Mitch could use a little positive exposure. Mitch didn't say much, but... Denny could tell he was pumped. The scope of this whole thing was really starting to settle over the big guy. Nah, uh, big kid was more like it. Excuse me, officer, did they catch the guy? Denny asked one of the cops around the perimeter. And now he was just showing off for Mitch. You'll have to check the paper or TV, sir, the cop told him. Honestly, I don't know. The cop was just about to get on the radio when Denny spoke up again. Sorry, but I don't suppose you got a spare ciggy on you. He held up a blue Bic lighter. People always like to see the homeless guy with his own match. And sure enough, the porker reached into his cruiser for a pack of camel lights. One's fine, Danny said, making sure Mitch was visible over his shoulder. We can share. The cop took two out of the pack. What unit were you with? 
Denny looked down at his faded camo jacket. 